Welcome to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast where seeing things differently inspires limitless possibilities. This podcast is being brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Limitless was created in order to inform, educate, entertain, and share stories from within the blind and partially sighted community in order to show the world that the opportunities for those who are blind or partially sighted are truly limitless. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your host, the executive director and founder of Blind Beginnings, Sean Marcelet. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcelet, and today you're going to meet some of our Blind Beginning staff and we're going to be having a conversation about what's happening at Blind Beginnings. So I'd like to welcome Rob to the other side of the microphone. Welcome, Rob. Well, hello. Wow, it looks really weird from over here. (laughs) And uh, Rob is our, he edits our podcast. He's our communications coordinator. Uh, So this is awesome for him to be able to actually speak on our podcast for a change. And I also want to welcome Emily, our program coordinator. Welcome, Emily. Hi, this is so exciting. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) Awesome. So maybe you guys can introduce yourselves a little bit. I feel like our listeners know me. I'm the founder and executive director of Blind Beginnings, and I grew up with a visual impairment and was really, really passionate about supporting children and youth and their families through this vision journey, which is why I started this organization. Um, But I think our listeners would like to know what brought you here and who you are. So... Rob, do you want to go first? I would love to go first. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, my name is Rob Minot, and as you mentioned, I am the communications coordinator for Blind Beginnings. My journey has been has been fairly interesting. Um, after university, I ended up getting going getting out of university with an English degree, and didn't had no idea what I was going to do with it. And I happened across a company that was hiring um, for a web designer at the time. And I had some web design skills and I landed at a place called Aroga Technologies and it was an assistive technology retailer and I stuck around there for the entire life of that company. Um, And so I've been in the assistive technology field for quite a while and alongside the disability community here in the Lower Mainland. And um, I really developed a a passion for the community and I developed a a real interest and started up a podcast over there. And I ended up landing here at Blind Beginnings. And we're really grateful that you did Mm -hmm. for many reasons, but mainly right now, the (laughs) fact that you had that podcast experience and really helped (laughs) us launch this one. So thank you. I think listeners everywhere are applauding. <laughs> I'm so sure. happy that I'm... this podcast exists. Here, <laughs> that's, that's in my fantasy anyways. <laughs> what about you, Emily? Well, for starters, I'm a podcast noob. This is my first podcast recording, so I'm very excited. But I You're doing talk... great so far, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I get to talk to Sean and Rob quite frequently, so this feels very natural and normal. For those who don't know, my name is Emily Burkholder, and I am the Program and Volunteer Coordinator here at Blind Beginnings. It is the best job ever. Basically, what that entails is supporting Sean in all of our wonderful programs that we do. So you often probably will receive emails from me if you participate in anything. Um, And since we're a small team, my um, job description varies and includes very random stuff, but I mostly just support Sean in all of our programs and coordinate our volunteers and have a lot of fun with that. I've just been with Blind Beginnings since August, so I'm very new to the wonderful community. I am also very new to the blindness community. I have no connection to blindness previously but a little bit about my background. I self-identify as a young professional. I am a graduate from the University of Ottawa. I studied international development. And with that, I got to travel and do research and study in the Caribbean, in South America, in Asia, and other places around the world. And I got a little bit of exposure through some work experience working with 
people with disabilities abroad. And when I found Blind Beginnings and instantly took a look at the website, it was kind of a no brainer that the organization aligns a lot with my personal values and my career aspirations, et cetera. So I love being with Blind Beginnings and I love the team here. You're also a, a newbie to uh, British Columbia. Oh yeah, I'm from Ontario. That's true. I'm yeah. from Niagara Falls, Ontario, that area. So August, I packed up a suitcase in the middle of a pandemic and came across the country <laughs> to work from home, but also experience the greatness <laughs> that BC has to offer. <laughs> I like to think you you were so attracted to Blind Beginnings that you were willing to move across the country in the middle of a pandemic. I, that's what I tell myself. 100%. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Rob, you also started during COVID. Yeah, I did. You know, I started in April. So it was not long after that an initial lockdown here. Um, and funnily enough, I also the same weekend that or the, the same week that I started at Blind Beginnings, uh, I moved as well. Um, so moving during a pandemic, not recommended. <laughs> Starting a new job during a pandemic, also not recommended. But um, so it's it's been a little bit of a weird experience for sure doing that that onboarding process, you know, through working from home. But it's also a little strange working for an organization with with all these this great programming. And never, I, I, you know, I have yet to actually see a program in person operate. So it's been a, bit, a little bit of a surreal experience. Yeah, I know that's the same for Emily. Like, and because of your limited experience with people who are blind or partially sighted, you haven't actually been in the room with a group of us yet. Yeah, every time I... For those who don't know, for a while, pre-second crazy wave, we were Fridays in the office. So I would, you know, every chance I got, I would be, Sean and I have talked about this, I'd be like trying to learn more about what what happens in the real world of Blind Beginnings. But I've mentioned to some volunteers that I feel like I've gotten to know quite a bit. Um, I always say, isn't it funny? We've never met in person. <laughs> but I, I yet to see, I'm excited to see the day when we all get to be together. You know, I've often wondered too, because I came on board, you know, after COVID had really started to affect all our lives, um, I, I, I thought, I, I never really got to see the process, Sean, that you guys went through in terms of pivoting that programming from something that was so heavily based in face-to-face -face programs to the online version of those programs what were those first few weeks or the first month like mm, yeah. yeah it's it's weird because the very last program we did was a family retreat on vancouver island where you know it was two nights three days uh <laughs> completely with a bunch of families like a, a large fairly large group of us together to come home and literally the next week everything shut down wow um the first two weeks, it was spring break. And so we actually hadn't, we don't plan a lot during spring break normally because a lot of people go away and it's just, I, I don't know, I, we just haven't. And I have a, a child that also has spring break, so it's <laughs> better for me to be available. And literally by the end of spring break, I had created a whole slew of online programming, like probably more Oh, not, not probably. It was more than, more than we needed and more that was more than was sustainable. But, um, I, I actually really like creating programs and this might sound weird, but you know, after you've been doing the same thing, I guess that's probably how teachers feel that teach the same class or the same grade over and over. And you kind of start to get bored with your own material. So it's been, on one hand, kind of fun to create some, try some new things, create some new programs. Uh, I think in the beginning, I was really focused on, oh my gosh, I need to make sure that everybody knows we're still here and there's, mm. there's still support. Like that was really my focus. And I wanted to make sure that we had programs for our youngest members all the way through. So, you know, I had like 
a kid support, a junior support group, a teen support group, and a 19 plus support group. And of course, a parent support group. And they all were meeting every week. And then there was like making sure we had baby beginnings and story time for the little ones, but then also some workshops for the teens and um, and then programming for parents. So yeah, it was just like, how do I make sure everybody knows they're supported? But there's only there was, you know, there's only one of me to go around <laughs> to, yeah. to offer all of that support. So we kind of realized we needed to scale back a little, but it was, it was tough. It was weird. And mm. I mean, and just like, I don't know, I'm a sensitive person too. So just being aware of what's going on in the, in the world at that time right. and, and carrying that while trying to sort of make sure the organization continued to move forward. And yeah, it was definitely a weird time. Before the pandemic, Sean, you, correct me if I'm wrong, were there some Zoom meetings? Yeah, I we had been trying to do some online programming uh, for probably about a year and a half before COVID. And we had uh, a parent group, an online parent group that, oh man, I had such a hard time getting people to come regularly. <laughs> it was like, I tried probably three different days and times of day. I tried having a topic versus not having a topic. I think the very first meeting, there was four parents and I felt like it was a su success. And then that ended up being the maximum we ever had for the next year and a half. So <laughs> that was really frustrating. Uh, I knew that we needed to be more accessible to people outside of Metro Vancouver, um, but I just, people weren't coming. And then we also were doing some, um, creating confidence workshops for teens as well. And those were starting to build a little bit. In fact, the last couple we did before COVID, you could come in person or join remotely. And even oh. some of the people who could have come in person chose to join remotely. So it was starting to become a little bit more popular. But definitely, if you ever want to increase your online programming, a pandemic works <laughs> marvelously <laughs> yeah I can't imagine having to go and do this all the time when you've had the, we've had the option of just sitting at home and logging in five minutes before and no commute and <laughs> that's funny yeah your job will change quite a bit when you've <laughs> got to buy snacks for the meetings and set up the room and clean up afterwards and all of those little details that we don't really have to think about right now yeah yeah it's so interesting to think about what people in this role have done in the past and how it's changed so much to what it is now. Mm -hmm. Do you find that th that is one of the, the advantages of shifting the programming online is, is just the, the reach that these programs have? Definitely. Yeah. I, it's been really, I guess, you know, there's some kids out there I didn't even know existed. Uh, a 12 year old, he's now 13 in a really remote part of British Columbia, who's uh, basically totally blind from birth that I didn't know existed wow. until COVID. And, you know, he really just became immersed in our programming and signed up for everything that he was the right age to be, <laughs> to be at. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of like our Kids Connect junior support group, we've got kids from Vancouver Island, Penticton, um, Burnaby, and actually even somebody in the Yukon and you know those kids would never connect with each other normally if we were trying to do something like this in person so in that way it's been pretty magical actually so you know given that that Emily and I have only been here well I've you know I've been here almost a year Emily less so since the summer I'm interested to to talk a little bit about the the programs and the history behind them um when you first started Blind Beginnings, what was the need that you really saw that, and, and what were some of those first programs like? There just needed to be more support for children and youth who are blind in general, outside of what's offered in the school system. I think teachers of the visually impaired do a fabulous job with, you know, getting kids through academically, but I felt like I was seeing kids graduate who didn't have mobility skills or didn't know how to make themselves a lunch. So they're moving on to university, but those basic life skills weren't up to par. 
And, and that was the case for me too. When I went to university, when I moved out for the first time, I lived on bagels for the first year, I think, you know, I, I didn't really know how to cook. And I, I, my mobility was okay. But in terms of life skills, it was kind of, yeah, I knew how to clean my house, but cooking was definitely something I did not have any practice at at home. So I just thought that there needed to be there was a gap. There was definitely a gap. There were some skills, even so, some social skills that kids were missing. And, and that was something I was hoping Blind Beginnings could provide. I think the other thing was just the positive perspective of blindness. And I think that's one of the things that makes Blind Beginnings unique and awesome is, if I, I'm allowed to say that, <laughs> <laughs> I think that Often people who are sighted view blindness as this really devastating, debilitating thing. And, and then that translates into lowering your expectations for what somebody who's blind is capable of and in maybe pitying them or patronizing them or whatever, just that that perspective really has an impact on how you interact with that person. And I just... I know for myself growing up, I felt that there was definitely something wrong with me and I was really ashamed and, and embarrassed about my visual impairment. And I really want to show kids today that being blind is not, uh, it's not bad. It's just different. And, and we are still very capable and, and can still pursue dreams and goals and be successful and have everything that anyone else can. So I think that was the need, a really big need, and it's still there. Unfortunately, it's not like something that's going to shift overnight, but I think we're trying to make a difference in that area. Um, the first programs were the, the things that didn't cost money. So the very, very first program we did was a community discovery family outing to the Burnaby Fire Hall. And the kids got to, it was mostly younger kids, like probably ranging from two or three years old up to maybe eight um, and their families. And the kids got to climb around on the fire trucks and meet the firefighters and, and kind of learn that when they hear a siren and somebody says that's a fire truck, you know, know what that is and what that means. And it didn't cost anything. So, <laughs> cause we didn't have any money in those early days, but I also did a creating confidence workshop for, for teens really early on. And that's a program that's still running. Um, and then about a year in, we started a junior explorers club. So it was like a monthly, once a month, a club for kids who are blind and their siblings to get together. And we did like different activities every month. Um, so yeah, those were some of the, the first original Blind Beginnings programs. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question for you just to go back a bit about that changing perspective and maybe I'm just going off script a little bit away from programs and more to our vision a little bit. Um, that moment where you see the shift in perspective or view of blindness, what does that look like and how does that translate into our programs or our, our members or our kids that we serve what is that what's that like yeah sometimes it takes it takes a while and sometimes it happens in the first conversation so uh, I can think of like one of the youth that I met for the first time when she was nine and her mind was blown repeatedly that I could do stuff and I was blind like how how can a blind person you know, cut their own food? And how can a blind person <laughs> shower independently? And how can a blind person run a camp? And how, you know, all these things, all these questions. And it was, yeah, it was, it was tedious, actually. It was like, ah, because I can, okay. <laughs> but she had grown up with a visual impairment and didn't believe that that was possible. And so mm. with her, it took a few years, you know, it was kind of over time and, and, multiple exposures and different experiences with me and other people who are blind to realize that, oh yeah, I can, I can be and do whatever I want to do. Um, so sometimes it's a gradual process, but sometimes it's talking with a parent and meeting them for the first time and their image of blindness is just so scary and sad. 
and then they meet me and they realize, you know, I'm a parent myself and yeah. I have this amazing job and I have skills and I'm, you know, I can hold up my end of a conversation and <laughs> I'm happy and I'm laughing and they realize, oh, like their whole perception of blindness, that doesn't fit, right? It's just not, mm. it doesn't fit. And I see it in I can feel it. I can, I just know that there's been a shift and they're all of a sudden their idea of what's possible for their child changes. And I mean, those are my favorite moments. Those are the best moments. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's really interesting too, because, you know, in my experience in, in the community and especially in, in the podcast, the other podcasts that I do again and again, we would talk to people who who grew up with a visual impairment, whose parents were very supportive and they didn't um, put limitations on them that grew up like fearless when you compare it with somebody who say did have that type of environment. So those formative years, it seems to me, it, it's really important to instill that in kids because they're going to take that and they're going to carry that with them for the rest of their lives. And, and you know, I've seen evidence of that and again and mm -hmm. again, with programming, do you do you sort of build the programming for specific age ranges? And is there like a sweet spot in terms of when you can sort of interact and engage with a kid that is really going to make the biggest impact? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because I think when kids are really young, you don't actually know that you're different until you're told that you are. So you don't like, I mean, in my case, I didn't even know I had a visual impairment to this degree until I was 12. That's generally later than most people find out. But um, I had some vision and could kind of navigate the world clumsily and just thought that I was clumsy. So, but until people around you tell you you're blind and then define for you what that means, you don't, you don't think you're any different than anybody else. And you're just living your life, doing your thing. So it can be for some kids a little bit later, you know, I don't know, kind of late elementary school or whatever, before they start to really feel the impact of that, like mm -hmm. what they can't, what they, what they can't do or what they're left out of or, or whatever. And, and the, I guess their own perception of what that means is that can take a little bit longer and how the people in your world talk about blindness around you and talk about the meaning of that is going to make a huge impact. So it does depend like, yes, I do program around ages. And I do think about, you know, in our kids connect group, which is age seven to 12, we're not really talking about how we're all visually impaired. It's, it's more in the background. So they're they know that all the kids that are there have a visual impairment as well, but they're always surprised when somebody will say something about Braille and some other kid will be like, you know, Braille, because they're just so used to being around kids that are sighted that don't know Braille, that it's like mind blowing when they realize that, oh, you've had that experience too, or you have a mobility instructor. <laughs> like my other friends don't even know what that is. So it's, 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 I guess, more subtle. But yeah. at the same time, I'm leading the group and I'm blind and they know that. And so they're kind of getting those messages. Um, it's more probably the teen years where we start talking about how we feel about being visually impaired and uh, what, what sighted people might assume about us because of our blindness or visual impairment and how to make people more comfortable and how to talk about it and how to answer questions and how to live in a world that is predominantly sighted. So, but I think, you know, how the parent has, has responded to the visual impairment all the way through the child's life makes the biggest impact. I think also, Sean, our, our programs are so unique in the sense that these people that are participating are among their peers they're they're the majority they're not sitting in a classroom where they're the only person with a visual impairment it's such a special space to be able to be among people that are like you and especially see you Sean leading these programs and and you know changing their own perspective of their visual impairment and seeing you do what you do and listening to your stories and about your life I think that 
has so much value that is hard to measure, but I think it really, it, it plays a lot into what our overall vision is, is for our programs. I know when I was growing up, um, I only got to be around other teens that were visually impaired pretty much one time a year at, at summer mm-hmm. camp. Wow. And that one week was like, ugh, I can't even describe how important that was for me, like to have those friends and connect. And just for that one week, I didn't have to pretend anything. I could just be who I was and I didn't have to be embarrassed and I didn't have to try to see or fake it or any of the things. Um, but it was only that one week and that yeah. I know how important that was. Like it is, it, it can be very isolating being the only one, the only one in your family, the only one in your class, usually the only one in your school and mm-hmm. maybe even the only one in your town that's young with a visual impairment. So yeah, it's so important to have that network of support because you are going to have bad days and your sighted peers aren't going to fully understand. And so right. to know that you've got those blind friends you can reach out to, uh, oh, it's, yeah, it's so, I just, I don't think I could have, I don't think I would have survived without that. And it's definitely what has pushed me to create these programs and these ways of people coming together and meeting each other and building that community. I like to call it the Blind Beginnings family. Like you're now part of our Blind Beginnings family and, and yeah, it's just, we're here for you. Mm-hmm. But what I find interesting is that, especially when I, when I interact with some of the youth alumni and, and watch them interact with each other, I have to sort of remind myself that, you know, all these kids that have such a close-knit community here, and they're in their, they're in their 20s, they're in their mid-20s, and they've literally grown up together doing Blind Beginnings programs, they now have built their own community and are building sort of this next generation of of a blindness community here in the lower mainland. And that's all because of blind beginnings. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of You're a superstar, Sean. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I think, you know, even though I only saw those friends once a year, we, we did stay in touch. Like it was way harder back then. Like, I don't know that there wouldn't be that community anyway. I think vision teachers were, are, you know, try to connect people and there's sports days and there's, um, there is other programming, but this regular, consistent, on a monthly basis, being able to come together, that wasn't happening, definitely. And I, I do suspect that the relationships are, you know, in some ways, maybe too close sometimes. They're, they <laughs> fight like siblings. <laughs> they, I think this, this little community has, they love each other and, and all the things that come with that, right? But it is cool. It is cool to be a part of that. You know what, let's talk a little bit about um, programs. Can you guys give us a little bit of a a snapshot of some of the programs that we're we're currently running? Yeah. Mm, Where to begin? We have so much (laughs) in store. 2021. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, everything's virtual right now. And I feel like we've kind of got something for everybody. Um, Exploring Work Wednesdays, once a month, we... I talked to a couple of blind or partially sighted adults about their jobs and their employment journeys. That's been pretty great. We did actually, uh, one of, one of those interviews we released as a podcast. Don't remember what episode that was. It was very early that was on. One. That was September, I believe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So if you want to get an idea of what that's about search back in the archives (laughs) Uh, but that that episode was Mark and Lisa and their brother and sister and uh, Lisa was a psychiatric social worker and Mark is a massage therapist who owns his own business and it was an amazing conversation so you know parents and youth can tune in and hear the story and then they also can ask their own questions so I guess the the goal is, is to just show the wide range of possibilities that are out there for employment for people who are blind. I think a lot of people assume that if you're blind, there's very limited jobs you can do. And I, that's not the case actually. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, we have a great turnout for that program. It seems like a lot of people are always returned to come back and our folks that Sean has interviewed range from, you know, Mark is a massage therapist. We have such a, a range of 
profession. So it's it's really it's a really interesting program. We have parents, youth, um, volunteers, vision teachers, folks from all, all areas of the community joining us for that just because it's so unique. We've even attracted people from outside of Canada <laughs> asking if they can join us for those workshops. So that's kind of cool. That's yeah. awesome. Shout out to anyone listening in other <laughs> countries who's asked to join. <laughs> <laughs> we also run, as we've mentioned, Kids Connect, which is a fun program. It's so much fun. It's basically a group of kids that get together after school and just chat for an hour and play funny games. And we talk about grandma's toes and <laughs> really ran. I always, without a doubt, leave with the biggest smile on my face. It's everyone's hilarious. And it's, it's a really, a really fun time. I think our uh, baking program is maybe one of the ones that I feel is like I never in a billion years thought we would be doing a virtual baking program, but it's actually working out really well. And uh, one of our youth mentors, Jill, who's blind, leads us and she's a she's comfortable in the kitchen. I'm not so comfortable in the kitchen, so I would not be leading this program. Uh, and families join virtually and everybody is sent the ingredients and the supplies in advance. And we all together bake the same thing and then we can sit and enjoy it and have a chat and eat our creation so that's been really great um our creating confidence workshop so we've got a new format this year and we're picking a different theme and then running a workshop with that theme for four to six weeks so right now we're doing a real teen talk for teens and we're talking about body language and physical appearance and things like how do you how do you choose your own style of dress if you can't see what is in style or what other people are wearing and how to put people at ease with your visual impairment and we're going to be getting into a little bit about flirting and friendships and how do you know if someone likes you if you can't see how do you let someone else know if you can't smile at them across the room, all that stuff. So that's really fun. And then in February, we're going to be doing one with the theme of mental toughness and resilience. So kind of some skills around mental health. And I mean, this has been a challenging year. And uh, I think living through this as, as a person with a visual impairment adds another layer of challenge. So hopefully we can teach some skills that will help help these teens kind of cope with the current situation, but just life in general. I am also a registered clinical counselor. So that's kind of the expertise I bring for some of these workshops and support groups. Mm -hmm. On Friday evenings, the end of the month, we have a creating connections program where we invite teens to hang out on a Friday night and we engage some volunteers that have either been in the program or new youth leaders um, to come and volunteer and run some games. So it's always a toss up of what the topic is and what the theme will be, but we always end up having a lot of fun just hanging out and playing virtual games or some get to know you stuff on Friday nights. Yeah, and that's a really laid back, fun, easygoing program where you're not having to learn any skills or <laughs> or talk about your feelings if you don't want to do that. It's a great place for teens to connect and meet each other and build some friendships. And uh, word on the street is we have something new coming up for parents. What's that about, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've got a virtual parents night out every second Thursday, and that's been running since the beginning of COVID. Um, actually, in the beginning, it was weekly, but now we're down to every second night. And it's so parents can can join in the blind beginning Zoom room and connect with each other. It's very it's been very, you know, just casual. So there's no there hasn't been a topic it's whoever wants to shows up. It's a drop in. You can come one week and then not come again for three months if you want, or you can come every time if you want. So 
um, it's been great. Parents have been able to connect from all over the province and meet new families, and it's great. Uh, in 2021, though, we are going to start having a workshop eat every other group meeting. So the first one will be at the end of January. Uh, the groups are Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. The topic for the first one is transitioning to preschool or kindergarten. So kind of getting, we have guest speakers, Adam Wilton from the Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired, who's also a teacher of the Visually Impaired, and then Bruce Taylor from Vision Loss Rehab BC, who's a vision specialist and a mobility instructor. And they'll be talking about kind of like, what do you need to do to make sure that, you know, all the paperwork's in order for your child to start kindergarten, but also like, what are some concrete things that your child should be able to do when they go to preschool or daycare, you know, like mm. put on their own jacket or, you know, what kind of containers are you using to pack their snack in and are they able to open them independently? Do they know how to do that? So those kinds of things. So I think it'll be really interesting, but basically every month there'll be one of our virtual parents night outs will be a workshop with a topic and uh, different topics each time. And I'm going to try to switch it up. So this one is kind of tailored more to families with younger kids. But I think um, in February, we'll be talking, we have a vision teacher who will be joining us and she'll be talking about the role of the vision teacher. So what can you expect when your child's in school from your teacher, the visually impaired, what what is the role? And uh, so that's really open to anybody with school age kids or anybody with younger kids who's just curious as well. Mm. We will also be running our Seeing Things Differently parent support group. And that's starting March 2nd. And it runs for six consecutive weeks. It's a Tuesday evening. So this is more a group for, it's for parents who would like to go a little bit deeper talking about their feelings about their child's visual impairment. Sometimes it, it ends up being parents who've only recently found out that their child has a visual impairment, but not always. Sometimes it, there are parents with kids who are, you know, eight, 14, whatever age, um, who just feel like they, they still have some grief and, and sadness about about the fact that their child is blind or partially sighted and they would like to talk about that some more. So myself and another counselor facilitate the group and uh, yeah, we talk about things like, what was it like when you first found out your child was diagnosed and maybe dealing with extended family and friends or even strangers and their questions and their reactions to your child's blindness and how do you cope with that or just, yeah, all the complicated feelings that go along with raising a child with a visual impairment. So it's a closed group. Uh, we can only have eight, a maximum of eight parents in the group. And we won't run it unless we have six. So it's kind of a minimum of six, a maximum of eight. Same parent, you know, we want you to come every week because you kind of each week builds on the week before. Um, but I, I can say that when we've run this program in the past, the parents who've gone through the program have really develop some pretty deep friendships with the other parents in the group because you really do get to know each other really well in, you know, six weeks of coming together repeatedly and, yeah. and opening up with each other. So I highly recommend it. I feel like it's something that every parent should participate in. Uh, and this will be the first time we're offering it virtually. It's always been face to face, but I think that we can, we, we're now pretty experienced with the whole virtual programming. So I'm confident that it will still be successful. And we can't leave 2020 without talking about our very exciting youth leadership program that we are switching online again. We ran it in the fall online after it was postponed in the spring, but this year we are adapting and and growing to our zoom version of youth leadership which will be great the very first youth leadership training weekend took place in 2010 so it was also one of our kind of flagship programs if you will uh and how how it worked before covid was that youth would come from anywhere in the province teens would come together for three days of leadership training and stay in a hotel and eat in restaurants and take transit. And so for kids who are coming from outside of Metro Vancouver, that was pretty fun, I think, to be able to take the SkyTrain for the first time or 
or just stay in a hotel and be away from your parents. Everybody loves that. Most people <laughs> when you're a teenager, love mm-hmm. that. Um, it was a really fun program, really successful. And then following the training weekend, there's sort of this practicum component where youth volunteer in different roles um, for blind beginnings. So those used to be things like our craft committee, where they'd be making crafts that we would sell at farmer's markets or Christmas fairs, um, or maybe our presentation committee, and they would learn more presentation skills and go out and do school presentations about blindness in their communities. Um, We had a newsletter, and youth would write articles for the newsletter. So there was lots of different ways over the years, different projects. We did a flash mob, and that was a youth-led project. Uh, We created a a CD, a Christmas CD that we sold, and that was a youth-led project. So it's sort of, we just kind of roll with whatever the skills of the kids are and what their interests are and develop that into these projects where they can learn some really important skills. Now with COVID, our training was offered online, um, which worked out fairly well. Obviously, we didn't get to stay in the hotel or eat in restaurants or take transit, which is, I I actually was pretty worried because I thought like, that's the fun stuff and we're cutting all of that out. How is this going to go? But it was good. I think it was really good. I think everybody that participated had a good time. And now some of the projects that they're helping with are things like this podcast. And that's where we get our co-hosts. They're all youth leaders who've gone through the training. Um, Our blog that we launched this year is, or I guess last year, is also contributed to by the youth leaders. And they're now organizing our Creating Connections Friday night programming. And some of them are helping out with the Kids Connect group. So we're just, we've just found new roles for them that kind of fit in with this new way of doing things, but it's pretty great. And we will be doing another youth leadership training in April. So is it April, Emily? Yes, April 8th. Right. So if you are a youth in British Columbia, 13 to 19 years of age with a visual impairment, and you would like to participate in our youth leadership program, definitely get in touch with us. We talk often a lot about isolation and stressors that COVID add to people. And I feel like specifically with youth and specifically within like a disability community, that's almost twofold. You know, it's way more stressful when you have a visual impairment to go out into the world during a pandemic than it is for somebody who isn't. So do you find that these online programs that that you've created for youth, it seems to me that they're even more important now than ever before because it really does decrease that sense of isolation or can help them deal with stress. Have you have you had a lot of feedback from people about the online programming in that sense? Um I know definitely the our young our youth alumni who are kind of now, you know, 18, 19, 20 plus that were independent traveling around, living their lives, coming to Blind Beginnings, doing whatever they did, really felt stuck when this happened. And I I know just personally too, like you, it is really hard to go out and be in the world because it's like there's arrows (laughs) to show where you're supposed to stand and walk and an order to things. And you're not supposed to get within a certain you know, distance of somebody and you can't necessarily tell whether you are getting in that distance or getting too close or not. So even for me, like I am rarely alone, actually pretty much never alone outside of the house. Actually, I'm never alone inside of the house either. (laughs) There's always somebody (laughs) home now, but um, it's weird. It's really weird. And it's not very comfortable. Just this morning, my son was asking me, um, how come you never take me to school anymore? And I was trying to explain that it's just really it's challenging because that's when it's the most crowded. There's lots of people. I can't really see where they are and I'm not really sure where to stand. Uh, I don't want to accidentally get in somebody's bubble. So, you know, trying to explain that to him was, is tough. And yeah, it's, it is, it's a weird time for sure. I think definitely people are feeling that. Um, I think definitely having the online support helps. I've definitely, I've noticed that just, you know, when we plan a meeting now, we can 
pretty much guarantee that people will be there because it's not like they're anywhere else. (laughs) So in that way, it's kind of uh, handy for our programming, but yeah, it's tough. I think they appreciate the opportunity to connect. I definitely, of course, I wasn't there pre with Blind Beginnings pre COVID, but I definitely sense a sense of eagerness to come to programs when there's no other programs really happening. If I can, I can tell that some of these youth are eager to participate. Um, and then something else I, I'm curious about, Sean, is that where did the where does the subject matter for a lot of the programming come from, or where has it come from historically? Has it mainly come from, say, personal experience, or is it more community driven and and from you know parental feedback and such? Uh, it's both. It's it's a lot based on, I think when I develop programs, I always start with what did I need at that age? What do I wish I had had? What would have helped my family? Mm -hmm. And that's a really good starting place. And it gives me a ton of material. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then now I can, as an adult, look back and reflect on what have I learned and what has helped me and what do I wish I had known So yeah, a lot of it does come from my own experience, but I I also take a lot of suggestions from families and youth and parents and, you know, kind of somebody will come to me and say, could we do this? Could we do that? Could we try this? Or could you do a workshop on this? Or, and a lot of the times I have said yes, and just kind of like done my research and tried to determine how do I do that? Or who do I, who Mm -hmm. do I invite to do that? So it's, it's both my experience and I guess the requests of the families that I work with. Okay. So Sean, what's, what's your favorite program ever and why? Uh, Good question. I'm curious of this answer. Hmm. I feel like it would be easy to say, do the grind blind. And I've probably said that in the past. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, Do the grind blind was uh, we took nine, nine youth who are visually impaired and myself, and we climbed the gross grind and accessible media made a documentary of it. So it's called do the grind blind. You can search for it on YouTube. I recommend checking it out. It's pretty fabulous. Ironically, I broke my foot just after we started training for do the grind blind. And, um, wasn't sure if I, oh, I'm kind of spoiling it here, but (laughs) (laughs) anyways, I broke my foot. So there's an added element of, (laughs) did she do it or not? But the program was fabulous and we got lots of media attention. And um, I guess it really, what I loved about it was, it was, if you've ever, if you, if you don't know what the gross grind is, it's this hike in Vancouver um, up Grouse Mountain And it's just crazy. It's just lots and lots of different stairs, but they're, most of them are just natural. It's not like symmetrical man-made stairs, although there's some man-made stairs as well, but it's like, you don't know, every step is different and you don't know what's coming. So even when you're being guided, it's kind of, your guide will say, oh, big step, but big step could be, you know, higher than your knee or, or something else. And so that it's like mentally challenging as well as physically challenging. And I think doing that really showed people, you know, just like if you, if you think that crossing a street would be really hard, if you can't see, then wrapping your head around the fact that we're doing the gross grind really shifts your image of what blindness means. And that's probably why I loved it so much. My favorite program, I think if I was around for the grouse grind, I would say the grouse grind because I long for the day when we do that again. That's so exciting. And uh, I'm glad I'm seeing Sean nod. (laughs) Well, there's a (laughs) lot of younger kids that want to do it as well. So I'm on that team. I'm with them. (laughs) (laughs) I, I don't know what my favorite program is. Well, I love Kids Connect because I think they're so funny and they all make me laugh. And I, maybe that's selfish. I don't know. I guess it's not a <laughs> program for, I think it's, it's my favorite, but then I also love baking. I love one. I love watching Jill just like power through this amazing program that we have and the way she's adapted it to make it her own. And it's awesome to just be a part of even like youth leadership. Like that was like, 
that was really early on when I started. It was in October and I just started in August and I was like mind blown by how amazing it was. And mm -hmm. right now our real team talk, like we've had one session, but I just have all these good feelings about it. And there's no program that I could, and Adam's story time, like Adam is an amazing storyteller. So that's always great. Yeah, we do have lots of great programming and we also have lots of great people connected to mm. blind beginnings that support us and help us out with with some of our programs and yeah so it's a, it's a pretty bad. great organization <laughs> well, um, do you guys have a sense of what the plan is for when covid's all over do you do you sort of see it being some sort of a hybrid of partly online and partly back to face-to-face -to -face programming that's a very good question and i think we are actually diving into some program evaluation work right now to try to figure that out because we recognize how beneficial the, the virtual programming has been in, in making our programs more accessible across BC. And we've always wanted to be here for all families in BC, not just mm -hmm. Metro Vancouver. But then we also recognize that there is some of the magic can't happen virtually. So it, I think it will end up being some kind of a hybrid. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like, but we're definitely talking about it, working on it, thinking about it, and always open to feedback all, as well. So we'd love to hear from families about you know, what what do you want to see? what What's working? What do you miss? What should we definitely keep doing? Well, thank you for joining me today. This has been great. I hope that our listeners, I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed getting to know you. These are the people working behind the scenes making this organization tick. So I'm definitely very appreciative that you have both joined the Blind Beginnings team. And thanks for joining me today. It's been an absolute honor on both counts. Yes, thank you. I, I'm a big <laughs> podcast, Blind Beginnings Limitless Committee fan, so happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll have you back at some point, too, I'm sure. You've been listening to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcelet. If you have a question or comment, please send us an email to limitless at blindbeginnings.ca and tell somebody about our podcast. Share this with a friend and please join us again next time. This podcast has been brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Music for this podcast is composed by Sean Bishop and Clement Chow. Production and audio editing by Rob Minot. For more information about Blind Beginnings and the work it does to support children and youth who are blind and partially sighted, along with their families, visit us on the web at www.blindbeginnings.ca and also remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.